Drew Beecham is back to talk about homebrew all-stars, experimental brewing, and saisons. This is Beersmith Podcast number 136. This is Beersmith Podcast number 136, and it's late October 2016. Drew Beecham joins me to talk about homebrew all-stars, experimental brewing, as well as saisons. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They're running an amazing deal right now, only $19.99 for a full year-long subscription, or $17.99 for the digital edition. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for home brewers and beer lovers. And you read my new column called Ask the Experts. Take advantage of the special deal now at beerandbrewing.com. Again, that's beerandbrewing.com. And also the world-class line of brewing equipment from Blickman Engineering. John Blickman has his first ever holiday giveaway where you can win a complete BrewEasy brewing system, quick carb instant carburetor, Hellfire burner, or BrewVision controller. You can enter for free by clicking on the banner at BlickmanEngineering.com. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, Beersmith Mobile. The mobile version of Beersmith is the perfect comp- complement to our desktop software. It includes all the tools you need to create recipes on the go, share them with your friends, or act as a pocket brew timer. Check out Beersmith Mobile at beersmith.com mobile or on the Google Play, iTunes, or Amazon App Store. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome Drew Beecham, who is co-author of the book Experimental Homebrewing, as well as the new book Homebrew All-Stars. Drew also hosts a podcast called Experimental Homebrew, which you can find on iTunes or at experimentalbrew.com. Drew, it's uh, great to have you back, man. Hey, it's great to be back. I always like coming on. So how, how are things? Uh, you and Denny launched a new podcast, I guess. Is that what I understand? Yeah, uh, we launched Experimental Homebrewing about a year ago now, actually, uh, as we're recording. And we just released episode 26. I see uh, that. Which is all about, yeah, and it's all about uh, New England Righteousness is the title of the the episode, but we did an experiment uh, involving New England IPAs and talking about, okay, what causes the haze? So the initial uh, the initial experiment was, okay, let's do yeast strains. Is it the yeast strain that causes the haze? Uh, and so we discussed some of the results that our Igors found uh, in that particular episode. We also uh, do interviews with brewers and home brewers, in this case, we talked to Larry Klausner, uh, formerly of Country Malt, uh, but now he's running a brewery called Pono uh, in Portland, Oregon. Nice. So, did you go? Did you go out to the brewery there? I see the picture. Did you go to the brewery? Yeah, we did. Well, it, and uh, uh, he's still contract brewing at the moment. They're they're building out the brewery, but we've actually sat down in this great little tap room called Beer Mongers, and sat down with Larry. And you can hear Denny and I talking with Larry and having a couple beers. And it's really just uh, fun. We did a whole trip up to Portland a couple of weeks ago where we hit four different breweries and talked to a couple of different people, uh, including a couple of home brewers. So like for the next couple of episodes, we're going to be very Portland centric. And then I'm going off to Fargo, uh, actually this morning, uh, to go do Hoppy Halloween. And while I'm there, we'll get some information out of the Fargo scene as well. That's awesome. Well, you're having fun. So you're doing a, is it a roving podcast or are you, uh, you're doing the same thing? Kind of. Yeah, kind of. It's the idea behind experimental brewing is we kind of said that we wanted to be the car talk of homebrew radio. Right. And so, uh, Denny and I are click and clack, uh, surrogates in this particular case. And we do a combination of science. So we do experiments with, we have a group of listeners who would call the uh, Igors or independent group of researchers and they actually do the experiments for us and we designed these experiments so we did some stuff on saison stall uh, we've done stuff on olive oil versus aeration uh, a couple of different uh, topics just to get people to start thinking about it and what we'll do is we'll present an idea for an ep- uh, for an experiment in one episode and we'll come back to it a couple of episodes later uh, with the results that our Igors have actually found And while we're doing that, we also talk about what's going on in the homebrew world. We go and we uh, visit with breweries. We do a segment that we call the Unknown All-Stars, where we go and we find people who are really great homebrewers who may only be known locally. Uh, 
and aren't necessarily so uh, full of themselves that they feel a need to have podcasts and books and everything else to promote their image. Uh, and we put them out there to say, okay, what lesson can we learn from you? Uh, we answer people's questions, and we also talk about a little bit something other than beer because, after all, we all have obsessions that aren't just beer-related, I hope. Mm-hmm. Um, I had the folks on from Brewlosophy uh, a few few episodes back, and uh, they're doing some great experiments as well. Have you have you talked with them at all? Oh yeah, we're uh, we're big uh, friends with Brewlosophy, and uh, particularly Marshall. And yeah, Marshall's, Marshall's actually on. yeah, Marshall's come on the show uh, more than a few times uh, to help us discuss out experimental results. And so yeah, we, we kind of consider that us to all be of. Uh, a field there with the whole idea of citizen science. Um, and cause really what Marshall's doing, what a couple of other folks are doing, what, what we're doing, it's all about trying to take back uh, the notion of what works particularly well for home brewers as opposed to brewers. Uh, there's a big difference in terms of our scale, in terms of our needs, uh, and all, frankly, the beer science that's been done has been done at the scale of large commercial breweries. Because they're the ones who care, they're the ones who have money running on it, and so that's the reason why we see a lot of techniques that get taught to us that are straight out of like a massive lager brewery that don't necessarily apply to us. So mm-hmm. now we're trying to figure out, okay, what does apply to us? Yeah, I know some of the things people worry about, like hot cider aeration and stuff like that. They they aren't as big a factor at the homebrew scale, right? Yeah, but then you have some new stuff that's coming up where you have some people who are very obsessed with a new technique that they're talking about called uh, Lodo brewing, uh, low dissolved oxygen. And the proponents of this method, and it's a very complicated method, and I look at it and I kind of shy away from it because I'm like, oh, that's too much work. Uh, but the proponents, of the, the folks who are cheerleading this method say that by limiting the amount of copper exposure and the amount of oxygen in the mash and the amount of oxygen in the boil, you avoid these sort of micro-oxidative reactions that they claim destroy malt character. And they are all obsessed about it because they say that's the magical it quality of German beers. And so they're, yeah, so they're, they're off doing that thing. And of course, Danny and I are both kind of looking at it going, oh, no, I don't think so. But we're going to have to do some experiments before we can go, you guys are silly and wrong. Because who knows? They may actually be right, but it may also still come down to a matter of is this something I care about because it is a very involved process that they're proposing so far. Um, have you, uh, let's see, you, you're on episode 26. Are you doing a podcast every other week now? Yeah, it's every two weeks. Uh, we've stuck to that schedule so far. I think I horrified Denny because Denny originally, I think, was thinking that we were doing two a month. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, no, no, we're doing it every two weeks. And I told him that one time when he thought, I have a break. I don't have to edit. And then I crushed his dreams. <laughs> well, I'm sure, I, he, I, I'm sure he appreciates well, I, that. Well, yeah, and I'm sure his wife does too. But uh, I, I refer to the podcast as basically <laughs> my way of keeping Denny from uh, uh, de- regressing while he's retired. Yeah. Yeah, he was telling me about the complicated process he goes through to try and sync the audio and everything because I guess he has kind of a poor internet connection or something. Yeah, well, that's what happens when you live in the middle of the woods of Oregon. Mm-hmm. So, um, you would have laughed to seen us uh, doing our field recordings because we're running a couple of uh, field recorders to get more than just the two of us. And we're sitting there doing the old-fashioned uh, hand-clap audio sync. <laughs> well, that works great, actually. That's a, that's a good way to do it. I know. It's, a, it's, it's perfect, but yeah, I mean, hey, he's got 50 years of experience doing the audio thing, so I'm not going to argue with him about it. Yeah. Um, well, I wanted to talk also about your book. Uh, you have a new book out called Homebrew All-Stars. I think I, I haven't had you on in a while. You were on back in, let's see, it was episode number 103 was uh, actually yep. the last time you were on, which was almost a year and a half ago. Uh, and since then, you've written a new book. So maybe you could tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so the Homebrew All-Stars, the idea was born out of the fact that Denny and I both credit a lot of other people for how much we know about brewing. And brewing, in a lot of ways, is one of those skills that's best transmitted by doing. Right. So to my mind, it's always best if you can 
go and see how somebody brews, if you can go brew with them, rather than necessarily just read or try and get some sort of virtual information about how it is they brew. So when I first started brewing, uh, I very uncharacteristically for myself went and invited myself to other brewers' houses. Oh, you're brewing? I'm going to come brew with you. Do you mind? And that, that for me, I'm, I'm a computer nerd. I'm not that guy normally. But I did it anyway, and I brewed with probably about 10 or 12 different people, and my brewing process even to this day is still sort of a uh, mishmash and agglomeration of different things I learned from other brewers. And so with this book, what we wanted to do was take that same idea that you learn best by brewing with others and put it into a book format. So we chose 25 of the more of uh, the most interesting brewers that we could find, you know, in terms of people that we thought would have good lessons to teach, and we broke everybody out into these sort of uh, Jungian psychological archetypes. So we have the scientist and process geek, we have the old school master, uh, the wild one, uh, and the uh, recipe fanatic, and then we had we had a couple other ones that are hiding out there that aren't in the book, uh, but we took these types, we laid out what the people were like. You know, who fit into these types because we also did surveys. We did surveys of our all stars, we did surveys of a general homebrew audience on the internet, and we sort of built up psychological profiles of all these things. And we just we describe who these people are and what they like, and then we actually go into the all stars and we offer profiles on each of these all stars. But most importantly, we also have the all stars teach a lesson. So you get to learn, for instance, uh, yeah, you know, from Mike McDowell, you learn about his uh, water salt methods, the fact that he has basically a few generic water profiles that he uses, so he's not trying to overcomplicate the water thing. Uh, you also learn about his fast lager method. Uh, we had Nathan Smith uh, talking about hops. We had uh, Lars, uh, Lars Gershaw, uh, Lar- sorry, Lars Marius Gershaw, Gershaw from uh, Scandinavia, uh, from I think he's Norwegian. Now, of course, I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> but this happens. Old age. Uh, but he's he is the Alan Lomax of beer up in that neck of the woods. And he's been running around uh, both in Scandinavia and Norway and in Lithuania doing research on traditional farmhouse ale styles and collecting the yeast cultures and how people do their beer. And so he walks through all that in his in his profile. And it's just really, really cool. It's stuff you would never learn otherwise. That's awesome. So, um, yeah. how'd you how'd you go about interviewing all these people? Because I mean, they're spread out, obviously, all over the country. In some cases, all over the world. Yeah, a lot of it, it was thanks to the internet. Now, you know, so a lot of email conversations, a lot of like, yeah, you know, hey, do you want to be involved in this? Here, go take the survey. You know, here's a bunch of questions. Uh, we would call people up and actually uh, interview them. Uh, it's kind of actually what started us down the road to making the podcast uh, because we started to figure out, hey, you know, we can do this a lot faster if we talk to people as opposed to making people write. Because it turns out, I think, if you want to get something written, you have to have somebody who has a sort of a disease in their brain that says, you know what I have to do? I have to write. A lot of people don't suffer from that impulse. So it's actually kind of hard to get people to write about what they do and uh, why they do it that way, because a lot of people kind of just don't have that desire to do it. I was going to say a lot of people, a lot of people don't write more than a couple lines in an email anymore either. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we're not in a letter writing culture anymore, so that's kind of gone bye bye. And so we did some phone interviews, but the, it was kind of hurting cats. And I think one of the funniest upshots that happened out of it was Denny would cajole people, right? You know, email them, hey, we, you know, our editor's getting cranky. We need to get information to him. Uh, please send back your answers. And finally, at one point, he decided, you know what? Fine, we're going to do this. And he said, look, if you don't give me back your answers in a week, Drew has threatened to brew a Manhattan clam chowder saison. And and he'll make you drink it. I, I and, think you I think you did brew that beer. I recall because you made me drink it, right? Yeah. Well, that was the thing is I emailed him back within about a minute of him sending that email because he didn't tell me he was going to send this. And I said, "How dare you? I am the proud son of 
a long line of New Englanders. And tomatoes are a capital crime against clam chowder. If I was going to brew a clam chowder saison, I'm brewing a New England style clam chowder saison. And in fact, here's how I'd do it. And I sent him the recipe. And then uh, about a month later, I think, he was coming through L.A. from Oregon to, to pick me up because we went down to Brazil to go speak at a homebrewers conference. And while he was there, he had a layover of a day. And so I grabbed him and I grabbed John Palmer and we brewed the New England clam chowder saison at my house. And then we brought it to the uh, San Diego homebrewers conference, which is where I had it. It was, it was quite good actually. I know that, that's the thing. Everybody's like, what? I mean, yes, it had clams in it and people freaked out about it. But when you actually tasted it, it tasted not like, Oh you know, big clammy seafoody thing. It tasted like an herbal saison with some creaminess and a little bit of saltiness to it. But it gave you some of those same impulses that you would get from clam chowder, which was kind of the idea. So, um, I was looking at the book reviews, and it's got a you know a ton of five star reviews here, and a lot of folks say there's just some amazing uh, brewing tips there in the ba- in the book. I was wondering if you could share a few of those with us, please. Yeah, uh, so mentioned earlier about. Uh, Mike and uh, Nathan's uh, part and Lars, but you also get uh, like Mike, Mike Tonsmere and Brandon Jones are in there and they're in the uh, wild ones category. So they both talk uh, their ideas for making wild beer. You have uh, Mike Karnowski, who is uh, a professional brewer in Asheville, who is now responsible. I believe his new brewery is Zebulon, Zebulon Artist in the Ales. Mm-hmm. And he's talking about how to start a barrel program. Uh, you have, uh, Roxanne Westendorf, who is the chairman, uh, or the chairperson of the AHA's governing committee, and she talks about how to be culinarily inspired to make your beers. You know, how to take things that you do in the kitchen and figure out how to apply them into the brewery. And so, and then you have uh, Amanda Burkemper out of Kansas City, who is big in the BJCP, and she's uh, got a lot of great experience doing competitions, both on both sides, both on entering and on organizing and she talks about that in in the book so there's a lot of different things that you can pick up it's just like and we didn't really have to poke uh, poke and guide people very very much we just said hey what's one thing that if i brewed with you you'd want me to know and without any questions or or real sort of oh no that's a terrible idea uh people came up with some really great and wonderful things the only guidance that we gave them was Look, here's a tip of things that we're going to tell people. These are your all-star tips. These are the things that everybody will tell you as an all-star. Yeah, uh, yeast health, fermentation, temperature control, sanitation, that. So don't worry about those lessons. If I'm going to learn something unique from you, what is it going to be? And that's what we got. And so what were some of those surprises? Can you share just a few? Off the top In terms of, of uh, what, what, I mean, what did, what yeah, did some of the people think, come up with? I think. Well, I think the funniest one was, so we have a, one of the archetypes that we have in the book is old school masters. And the old school masters is, that's the person for whom the Ryan Hotsky book is holy law, right? Beer shall have, uh, the best beer in the world only has barley, yeast, uh, water, and hops. And, you know, nothing else and all that's weird. And so one of the one of the people in the old school masters category, and he tested out as an old school master. We said, okay, in addition to giving us a lesson, we also want you to give us a couple of uniquely you recipes, like recipes that you're really proud of that that you think express, you know, some characteristics of you as a brewer. And so one of the one of the old school masters was Joe Formanick, uh, out of Chicago, who's one. Uh, I think he's a two time Ninkasi winner. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he does uh, a whole bunch of beer stuff and uh, he's just really a wonderful guy. Oh, and he won the long shot competition for Sam Adams. So the man's got some creds and he's in there and old school master. He's talking about, Oh, you know, I really like, uh, Hellas and Pilsner and all these sorts of things. And then his recipes and his lesson are all about how to use bananas in beer. <laughs> how did he get it started with bananas? I guess. If I remember correctly, and it's been a while since I, I went through my notes on it, but uh, he got fascinated with the whole East African tradition of banana beers. And so if the East Africans can put bananas and beers and they're good, 
then why not try it in our own way? So one of the recipes that is in there is a banana imperial stout that he swears to all things is a fantastic beer. <laughs> Interesting. I yeah. Uh, yeah, you ought to hook him up with Randy Mosher. Randy uh, Mosher brewed a uh, big banana beer, I think, at Five Rabbit Brewery. Uh, you say, I can't remember, it was roasted bananas or something like that. Yeah, I mean, it, well, you got to figure they're both in Chicago. So I, I have to imagine they're, they're yeah, both yeah, the same. Yeah. So. Um, well, one of the themes of the book is clearly that there's no single path to good beer. Um, what were some of the surprises that you and Denny found when you started uh, interviewing people uh, and, and talking about you know their path? You know, with a lot of the all stars, we saw some you know very kind of consistent information, right? Because you know, like, we're all learning the same way. I think where we actually got the most interesting information was out of the surveys that we did. We got I'm trying to remember, I think we got somewhere in the neighborhood of about a thousand responses. Uh, from home brewers uh, across the globe about what they did and you now what was the best way to brew how did you brew what's your process and i mean what was hysterical for me to see was we would ask people so uh what do you think is absolutely the most important thing about brewing and what do you think is the least important thing like what what thing do you think people pay way too much attention to like for instance i was expecting we'd get a lot of answers like uh hsa right mm-hmm. Because that's that's the big one, right? That's the classic. Yeah. Oh, don't worry about that. Uh, but what really cracked me up was to see the number of times that I see responses between those two questions that's exactly the same thing. Yeah, you know, like, oh, the most important thing you can do is your yeast health. The least important thing that you can do is your yeast health, right? Yeah. You know, uh, oh, you've got to really obsess about uh, cell counts. Don't worry about cell counts. <laughs> Your water is the most important thing. Your water is not the most important thing. So it's become very, very, very clear. And I think you see this as well with the uh, experiments from Brewlosophy and the experiments from us and others where, yeah, the malt wants to become beer. Yeah. And, and really uh, for some new projects that I'm working on with Denny, uh, I sort of developed a new motto, which is, uh, fermentation is entropy captured. So yeah. th- there's a lot of ways to capture entropy, and it seems like there's a lot of ways to get from chaos to goodness. And really what it is about is finding that path that carves out best for you and produces the beer that you like. Now, uh, you decided to also include recipes from each of the brewers. Uh, did you find any common ground there, or was it people all over the place again? No, people were all over the place. Uh, although I will say, I, I do think there's one good trend that, that I saw, which is for most of the brewers that we had recipes from, the recipes themselves were not uh, super complex, right? So we weren't seeing like the IPA with 50,000 hop additions and, you know, seven malts, right? So there was a lot, of, I would say probably the most consistent thing that you saw is a lot of focus, but we still saw things like where even with the old school masters where I would suspect that, you know, these are people who are dedicated to the idea of, you know, sort of that good ingredient, right? Those, the locality type thing where we saw a lot of people who were going, oh, I just use domestic two row. I don't use a Pilsner malt or I don't use a German malt. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that probably the, the best thing I saw was people – choosing to be much more focused and simple. Uh, there's uh, a great uh, sour beer recipe in the, in the book. I think it's from uh, Brandon Jones. And it's literally Pilsner and dark sugar. <laughs> that and, sounds pretty good to me. And, and he gets just incredible complexity out of it. So It's like uh, somebody sent me a cider recipe the other day. They said it was absolutely fantastic. And it was basically cheap cider and brown sugar. That was it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, chapitalized apple juice, uh, which is what that is, is so fundamental to cider making that it's not even funny. I mean, it's winemaking too. Yeah. And yeah. if you really stop and you think about it, it hasn't been that long in the history of brewing and everything else that we've had 
that we've had all these sorts of crazy, goofy ingredients that people can throw into the kettle. So there is a certain sort of uh, historiosity to uh, stripped down recipes. Well, I mean, this comes back to the theme that you and I have talked about, I think, quite a bit in some of the podcasts we've done already, which is just simplicity, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and I'm a huge proponent of it, which, of course, given the fact that I'm the guy who goes and makes clam chowder saison, might be a little bit of odds, but whatever. Uh, I think, uh, what was it, uh, Whitman, uh, uh, Walt Whitman, I quote this in one of our talks, uh, he says, uh, I am large, I contain multitudes. No. <laughs> um, well, have you done any interesting brews lately? Have you been doing anything uh, new? I know I know we talked uh, quite a bit about Saison's in the past and so mm-hmm. on. Yeah, uh, I'm still working my way through the Saison project uh, that can be found at maltosefalcons.com where I'm attempting to brew the exact same recipe with uh, every Saison strain I can find. Uh, the problem is every time I think I'm getting close to finishing – about five more yeast companies pop up and offer about another three yeast strains. So it's like, ugh, you people are killing me. But I just did um, I just did a, a new beer that I'm calling the Double Irish Brown. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I did that with a uh, Laughlin uh, family malts from Ireland that I think are uh, – they're one of my favorite new things to play around with. Interesting. And, yeah, it's, it gives this really sort of wonderful nutty character uh, to the beer – without even having to try. And the, the, the wort that it produces is just absolutely stunning in color. Um, and I'm, try, I'm trying to play around a lot now right now with double browns because I think the that whole double brown idea, or that imperial brown if you want, uh, where you're not going for overhopped like American double brown, uh, but a big strong brown beer I think is going to be a really interesting base to build things on. Uh, the other one I also just did was uh, – I did a New England IPA because I think the bylaws of the world are stating nowadays that you have to make a New England IPA. I don't know. Seems yeah, like I think that. everybody's making IPA, so why not? Well, but specifically, New England IPA. So I did one that I'm calling the Gold Coast, and it is my Gold Coast New New England IPA. And it is a pale malt with golden naked oats and uh, YU's 1318. And then all the hops are a bittering charge of El Dorado. So I got the gold, right? El Dorado's, then, El Dorado's pretty good, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I really like that fruitiness. Uh, and then every all the other hops in it are Whirlpool editions and some regular kettle editions of Australia's, uh, both from Australia, uh, Vic Secret and Australian Summer which are also uh, very uh, fruity, but also with some kind of interesting herbal tones to them. And I went and I poured that at a charity event that my club did for uh, the Friends of the LA River, which is an organization that's trying to restore the LA River, kind of remove parts of it from the Army Corps of Engineer concrete ditch that they did back, mm-hmm. in, the, mm-hmm. back in the day. It is and beautiful, so, isn't it, the, 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 the big ditch? Yeah, oh yeah, it, it's absolutely gorgeous. But the parts where they've actually restored it and turned it back into a river, are really good. Now, and I don't want to disperse the big ditch too much because the big ditch did save a bunch of lives because it was built to stop flooding. But uh, they're trying now to reconstruct parts of the river and return it back to more natural flow. And so they had a charity event, and we went and they invited us to go pour beer. And so we're pouring beer, and uh, we blew through all of my New England IPA, which was awesome. And also at the same time, we had Moby performing about – 50 feet in front of us for 500 people. Oh, nice. Yeah. It's like the wonderful, weird places that homebrew can take you. (laughs) Well, that's great. Um, Well, uh, do you have any more to say about Saison's? I guess we wanted to, I wanted to make sure we covered that topic. uh, Well, yeah. Yeah. I I would say, so I've advocated for years, uh, the idea of doing open fermentation for your Mm Saison's. So my standard process has always been, or, not always, but my standard process as of now is chill the wort down to uh, 63, pitch your yeast, put it into a water bath, and keep it or, or into a fermentation chamber, whatever your methodology is for keeping your wort cool, and keep that down at around 63 to 65 for the first three days with no airlock. 
just a piece of sanitized foil on top of it. Uh, let that rock and roll, get uh, get the foundation moving, and then after that, allow the the beer to auto rise. You know, kind of come up to wherever it's going to come up to based on the heat of where it is that you're at. Now, for me, I I ferment in a garage in Pasadena, California. I never have problems getting too hot, or sorry, I, I never have a problem with it staying too cold. I do have problems sometimes with getting too hot, but if you do that. I've always argued that that avoids the classic Saison stall that you see from sort of where it's supposed to be the classic DuPont strings, you know, uh, YE's 3724, White Labs 565. And I'd been told, or I'd been given information in the past about it being due to back pressure sensitivity on the strings. I don't know if it is actually back pressure sensitivity, but it always seems to work for me. So we had an experiment where we did that, and we had six different results returned to us. Mm -hmm. And we had people observe the fermentation process. And of the six, five of them showed that the batch that they had an airlock on stalled, did the classic Saison stall where you know it gets down to like 1030 or 1020 and just stops for like two weeks. No kidding. And, yeah, and the ones with, uh, with a foil uh, out of five of the six trials sailed with no problems. I, no I just, I'm, I'm finding it hard to believe that an airlock would cause that much uh, pressure to build up. It, it can't be hardly, it can't be what, a pound? I mean, it can't right. be much. Well, and so, and I got, uh, I've gotten a lot of pushback about that. And of course, I learned that from folks at Y Yeast and White Labs. Then, you know, that's what they had told me. Now, I don't know if it is actually back pressure sensitivity as much as it's probably like CO2 toxicity. Because remember, the, Puted origins of Saison yeast are wine yeast. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, we know that wine yeast are, are CO2 uh, toxic, or they're prone to, to toxicity uh, sensitivity. Yeah. So you can actually sense. you can look it up now because, uh, uh, you know, Chris from White Labs has actually done the genetics on it now. Yeah. And, there's, and there's basically so, only two groups of yeast. There's one that's uh, wine related, as you, as you point out, that has a higher... Uh, alcohol tolerance and then there's one that's uh probably closer to bread yeast actually the beer yeast if you will yeah but if they if they are from the wine yeast and wine yeast are sensitive to co2 uh, in solution then it would make perfect sense that doing open fermentation would actually lower the amount of co2 left in solution during fermentation and allow you to actually you know avoid that stall that's so pretty cool yeah and and of course what was funny to me was like i said we had five of six Participants report back them that they saw the stall with the airlock and didn't see the stall with the foil. Uh, the one participant who didn't see the result was Marshall from Brewosity. So, of course. <laughs> like, like, oh, you're killing me, man. You're killing me. <laughs> but that's been my favorite, uh, my favorite of the experiments that we've done so far and that, because, of course, it goes right into my Saison love. And I think it shows that there's a real there is actual realness or, you know, some sort of concrete uh, evidence to the validity of the method that I do. At least that's what I'm going with. Interesting. Yeah. And of course that's the traditional method. I mean, that's the farm method, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I believe as homebrewers, we get away with a lot more stuff because we focus so much on yeast health, right? You know, if you think about like all the old school techniques that we were taught as homebrewers, a lot of that seemed to be mostly getting around the idea that you had, uh, poor yeast health. Uh, so I think we get away with more. But I do think that a lot of people walked away from fermentation, and I love some of the characteristics that you get from it. Well, of course, your new uh, podcast is named after the book uh, Experimental Homebrewing, which uh, yep. which you guys did a couple of years ago. It was, it was you and uh, Denny Kahn, of course. Mm -hmm. um, what, uh, you know, your podcast, you've done 26 episodes now and you've done a number of experiments. What interesting things have you found there uh, related to the experiments well, we, we were just talking about? We talked, yeah, we talked to the Saison one, which yeah. is the one that, of course, is nearest and dearest to my heart. Uh, but uh, the other one that I, <laughs> I have to admit that we really wanted to do because uh, we wanted to disprove it was we did one that was about olive oil versus uh, aeration. Oh, yeah. So. Uh, you remember a couple a couple of years ago, olive oil became a thing. Yeah, you know, it's like, oh, look, just add a drop of olive oil to the to your work. Well, it's less it's less than a drop. It's like a micro drop kind of thing. Yeah, it's. <laughs> I think I'm trying to remember. I think we ended up using twenty microliters or something like that. And twenty microliters is 
extraordinarily small. We had to we had to have one of our Igors measure it out with a micrometer for us. Um, but we decided, okay, look, you know, neither of us actually think that this is a real thing. And if you go and you look at the circumstances being described in the paper uh, by uh, Grady Hall out of New Belgium, yeah, I did, I did that, uh, read that paper. Talk- yeah, and and he was talking about using olive oil in yeast springs. And using that during the storage process to avoid having to uh, oxygenate the wort that was coming out of the boil kettle. Uh, They eventually ended up not doing it. And he will fully admit, I never even thought about people trying to go and add olive oil to the fermenter. Because the problem is that getting the oil to dissolve in the wort sufficiently so that the yeast can uptake it. And have enough time for the yeast to take it up before they actually start to try and ferment. So he, he kind of thought it was a non-starter. We kind of thought it was a non-starter. And so we had people do an experiment where we said, okay, look, we're going to give olive oil the best case scenario we can think of to, to succeed. Mm-hmm. We want you to brew two batches of an amber ale that we've kind of based around fat tire. And we want you to do one batch with absolutely no aeration whatsoever, straight into the fermenter, pitch your yeast into it. And we want you to do a second batch where you add this dose of olive oil and then yeast, right? So this is about as far away as far as you can get. Mm-hmm. And our, our hypothesis was you're not going to be able to tell a difference. And it turns out that when we looked at it, it's the clearest set of data that we've ever collected. Yeah, uh, blind tasters could not tell the difference between the beer with olive oil and the beer that received absolutely no aeration whatsoever. Yeah, I, I, I'm not terribly surprised, I guess. No, we weren't either, but it was it was nice to have it out there and say, look, see. In fact, and Marshall like Marshall I, was telling me a lot, you know, a large number of experiments they do, they come up with, they they just don't have a statistical difference when they actually go to taste the beer, you know. Yeah, um, and when I think, again, that's a good portion of the reason for that, even like when he's doing his fast and dirty beers, is our ingredients are so much better. We have more solid command of technique. We have more solid equipment. And we also, uh, most importantly, I think, have more solid command of our yeast. Uh, so I think that allows us to get away with a lot that we don't uh, that we wouldn't have been able to in the past. Uh, we also have experiments that are coming up about uh, uh, Brutan B, which is a chemical uh, that is actually from uh, Joe Formanek, who we talked about earlier. That's supposed to uh, sort of do some of the things that people talk about. Lodo brewing will do for you. We have one where we're actually going to we have. Uh, God, I think like 35 different batches of beer being brewed for this, where we have an IPA recipe, a pale ale recipe, and a double IPA recipe. And we have our Igors brewing these batches of beer, and they are going to send them to us uh, and have their IBUs analyzed. And they're all using the exact same set of hops that we got from Nico Brew. And Nico actually had the hops analyzed from uh, by YCH. So we knew exactly how much alpha acid was in the hops when we sent them out to the igors. Mm-hmm. And so now we're going to say, okay, look, we calculated out what these, what the IBUs in these beers should be. Let's see what they actually are. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'd be willing to bet they're not too close to what the estimate is probably. Yeah, right. I had, well, I've they're... had, I had, I had Gary Tinseth on a long, long time ago, but one of the, one of the early shows for the podcast. And even he told me, you know, we, he was using one set of equipment and he matched his equation to that set of equipment. And, you know, he said, if you change too many things, it's not going to be exactly the same, you know? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, we got time maybe for, for one more experiment. So if, if you want to describe maybe uh, one more result from the last year and then, uh, uh, and then we'll close it out. Sure. And I think the other one that we did that wouldn't have been uh, too surprising to people was the very first one that we did. Uh, we or actually, no, I'm sorry, I'm going to take it back. I think it's going to be a little surprising to people. We did uh, a yeast comparison between uh, white yeast 1056 and white labs 001. And we had our Igors go and basically brew the exact same beer. And they did my, my Magnum Blonde, which is about as plain of a beer as you can get. And had them go through and, you know, pitch one with the uh, YU 1056, one with 001, and let's see what sort of results we got. And so whenever you talk about uh, p-values, you know, you always talk about, all right, if there's a significant, if there's a possibility of significance to the change mm-hmm. uh, in a triangle test, then you want to see that your p-value uh, comes in at a threshold of uh, 0.05 if you're going to be really, really rigorous about it. 
Okay. Right? And um, what we did when we combined everything together was we had, let me see, seven different experimenters return results on that. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, even though uh, most of them were coming back as showing not significant, if you aggregated the results together, which a lot of people argue about, and a lot of people tell me that I'm being statistically stupid, which is more than likely, um, we actually found that out of the 64 tasters that they gave these beers to, 29 successfully identified a di- the different beer, right? So they identified which one was 1056 or which one was 001. That's and a that's pretty actually, big number, yeah. Yeah, and that's actually enough as a from that data set, if assuming that straight aggregation works, that would actually say that no, tasters can actually tell the difference between 001 and 1056. So kind of interesting uh, cool. a little surprising but uh yeah, still i mean it's kind of fun and i'm looking forward to some of the other ones that we have coming down the pike that we haven't announced yet uh but we're, we're just having fun with it and really what we're trying to do is we're trying to get people to stop and think about what it is that they're doing that's awesome well uh well uh wanted to see if you have any closing thoughts uh yeah closing thoughts beer is good enjoy your beer people your beer I'm, loves you. I'm enjoying one right now, actually. Well, yeah, as soon as I get done with dinner, I'm, I'm going to go pour myself a beer. Uh, trying to think. I think I'll, I'll, I'll go break into my stash of uh, Rochefort 10 I found the other day at the grocery store for $4 a bottle. Mm, that sounds pretty good. Yeah. yeah if, it, by the way, definitely walk down by the uh, discount bins in your store. Sometimes you may find some good deals. They literally had 14 bottles of Rochefort 10 for $4 a bottle. It was 50% off. Wow. So it was like... Yeah. Yeah. Not at my yeah, grocery store. store <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, but I, I totally walked out of that grocery store with all 14 balls. <laughs> yeah. Well, Drew, thanks again for being on the show. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much, Brad. I always enjoy coming on the show and talking here. Thanks again to Drew Beecham for joining us. Drew is co-author of the books, Homebrew All-Stars, as well as Experimental Homebrew. And he hosts a new podcast with uh, Denny Kahn. It's called Experimental Homebrewing, which you can find at experimentalbrew.com uh thanks again drew thank you well a big thank you to drew beecham for joining me this week thanks also to craft beer and brewing magazine every issue is packed with great information for homebrewers and craft beer fans take advantage of their fantastic sale and get your one-year subscription now for only $19.99 from beerandbrewing.com and also the world-class line of brewing equipment from blickman engineering my friend John Blickman has his first ever holiday giveaway where you can win a complete BrewEasy brewing system, quick carb instant carburetor, Hellfire burner, or BrewVision controller. You can enter for free by clicking on the banner at BlickmanEngineering.com. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, Beersmith Mobile. The mobile version of Beersmith is the perfect complement to our desktop brewing software. Check out Beersmith Mobile at Beersmith.com mobile or on the Google Play, iTunes, or Amazon app stores. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week. Mm-hmm.